Today we have Dr. Stephen Hirsch. He's competing with the background of the musical instruments for our podcast. And the topic of discussion is going to be independent practice in the suburbs of DC, a day in a life. Let's take it away. Stephen, it's a joy to have you on the podcast. So one of those people that knew it from a young age. So around the age of seven, give or take a year, I just declare it to the adults in the world that I just wanted to be a pediatrician someday and have my own office. And there's nothing like it. So if you can have a career or that what you do most of the day, it's wonderful. And uh, going through the years, I, I like science. I like biology, the human body, fascinating. So it just made sense for that to be my career. And going through medical school and residency, general pediatrics always called out to me. And the aesthetics of the office on your workday and your patient. And I knew that when you're building an office and you're making a design and experience for the family, like they will extrapolate from that. Wow, you put this much intention into your design and every little detail or it's experience is great, you might actually provide that same level of care to my child. We try to make it as unique as possible or surpass expectations. The, the environment and the environment you create in you know, the physical space, as well as the atmosphere of your employees, it, it does create a, a, a feeling that uh, sometimes makes families want to be here and join here and, and your team members, your, your support staff and your doctors also want to be here. So I, I think it's been helpful and uh, just to, to how we invest in the practice, the aesthetic. Unlike most pediatric offices, your office is clean. The <laughs> countertops are not cluttered. Everything is clean. Right. Sometimes a little OCD is helpful. And I do walk into the office most days and I'm, I'm just going to walk up and make sure I don't chip anything, but I'll kind of do this and just look at the floors and the ceiling just to make sure everything is where it should be. And the analogy I always think about is going to like a, a nice hotel or a nice restaurant. When you go to a, a nice hotel, a nice restaurant, you're not going to leave there thinking it was really nice, but my lab bathroom was just not good. Or I showed up and that hostess stand was just cluttered. Or you're going to feel like you're taking care of every step of the way. Yeah. Every care of the bathroom, yeah, it's a, it becomes a pigsty. And kids, they mm -hmm. people have to yeah. take care of it. That just shows that you care about everything else. You care about the bathroom. Uh, yeah. The other thing that just drives me absolutely bonkers is when I go to the doctor's office, pediatrician or not, I'm visiting someone and they have the old school front desk with the glass window and they shut it. Yeah. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> like they yeah. said, it's the yeah. rudest. That the message is we don't want you here. Right. When you go to a lot of like systems and hospitals, it feels very cold. They probably yeah. have some very expensive artwork in the lobby. That's about it. And Stephen, why do you think that independent practices are the best for pediatricians and the patients that we serve? But for those people that, that stick it out and have a strong interest in the practice management and just the, the whole the, running the, 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 the practice, um, I think a well-run independent pediatric practice can outperform as far as like patient satisfaction, quality measures, um, employee satisfaction, um, because at the end of the day, when we make decisions, we're always going to ask ourselves what's in the best care for the children. So what's in the best care for the children? And to that extent, what's best for the doctors and what's best for the support team. Um, and I also think independent practices where they can do better is they can manage the whole levels of practice management. It's all part of the relationship. And I knew it would quickly outgrow just being me. I liked being by myself. I was solo up until about three years ago and they brought on then two more doctors. But no, I, I think you can. So if you want to scale it up, you can, but then you're going to lose a little bit of that relationship because you're not everywhere at all times. So I think you can scale it to some extent, maybe bigger, but I've just never had an interest in franchising. Or, I think what Steve or, hold on one second. some experiences that I had with training of newer physicians, we used to think that the computer was the problem. So we used to train them for two weeks on the computer. I'm starting to see that the computer is really not the problem anymore. Some of them say to me, do you think I don't know that? Do you think I've never seen that? They look at it as so you're watching them. Dr. Riley, my associate, my partner at the office, he looks at the charts. They feel like they're being bullied. Somebody's watching them. So there's a little bit of a fine, it's a dance that you got to do without upsetting somebody. Oh, stop it. 
the senior not partner this year. Not more, not but about the, the senior partner just took a chart handed to and the owners are a bit burnt out when they bring on people. So they're just so happy to have some relief. And the electronic medical record is not greed at conveying exactly what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure the practice owner is aware of it. Mm -hmm. Like I called child protective services on a 17 and a half year old. Okay. And I documented that I called, left a, left a note, mm -hmm. the report number. And when I told Dr. Sinha why I did that, it was like, here's why I did that. This is a 17 and a half year old that's lost 25 pounds in the last two years, is down to 90 pounds. Well, I always thought how funny it would be if I, if I could just walk in there and just say exactly what I know and see and what to do with no discussion and just, okay, doctor, we'll do that. Parenting is scary. Have you ever been on a plane? They say, put the oxygen mask on you before you put it on the kid. I'm like, I'm done. I'm, and I don't want to be unhappy with my EMR anymore because I see these clients with PCC and they're just strangely happy. They never done. blow off. They never blow off and say the other guy's problem. And, and what did, were you getting easy W through the children's CIN? Is that? I eventually, yes. Initially I, I had it myself. I had the server in my office. We were independent. The CIN came many years later, and, but yes, we, if people are leaving the practice and you can learn the reason, and it's a reason that is something that you can manage and it's something to think about. Do every one of our kids have their checkups up to date? We schedule our checkups a year in advance. Vaccination rates are important. We get higher uptake from that. The funny thing is that sometimes people look at requirements as what's necessary, but it's not really the best medicine or best care. Right. So it just makes it easier because you got it. And mostly for the four-year vaccine. Yeah, I think the schools are going to want to see that. I, I, I understand the reason for nine, but we're not having an issue with uptake. So we get about 11. Because in New York, the QIP, the quality incentive programs, measure you at nine, not at 11. Well, I'm happy just to keep them at 11. You have kids that are, when they're out of school or when they're going to camp and stuff, you around that. If we're going to move your appointment after you scheduled it, we're going to accommodate you and make sure we get you in a time that works for you. We're not going to say, oh, which is a problem with non-independent practices. I, all the time you'll hear, oh, the hospital called me. They canceled my appointment for tomorrow. They can't see me for two months. I'm like, that's absurd. That's just, that's rude, actually. So if I'm not available, we'll have a covering doctor. But first of all, I'm going to look even outside of PCC. Is the practice, are we growing? Are we stable? The AR is very important. Most claims should be paid within 30 to 60 days. Use them or don't use them is what I need you to do. So I think focusing on that visit to check up ratio is important. But people need access to care because especially this new generation of parents, everything is an emergency. Our schedule, we probably see less appointments per day than most practices. We offer them the advice directly from the doctor. They don't have to go through anybody to get an appointment. All these things add up. No, we'll, we'll tackle that in a minute because I, I have a very interesting conversation on that. Be very intentional with that. It's not going to be great financially. Like you're not going to turn that into a profit generating behemoth. And I think that's where offices run into trouble is when I built this office, we had a bigger space. We we're bigger than what we needed at first. So we grew into it and, and we had the space and we added space about five years ago. And you, you need to add the space, right? You need your therapist to have a dedicated room. We actually built a second room as a waiting room for the therapist because we didn't want the families waiting in the main area. It just is not comfortable for them. And so I think it can work if you're intentional and you just advertise and you interview people and what you're providing them is a guaranteed source of patients. They don't have to deal with, and they don't have to deal with the scheduling or the headaches or the billing of it, but you just have to decide it's important for your practice. And you know, when everything is important, Herb, something happened, but you're writing something. Don't worry. I'm not taking him hostage. Don't worry. Interesting thing. We did a mental health project with one of the hospital systems, right? Where they embedded a social worker. So we didn't mm -hmm. have anything really. We gave them a room. They paid us a little bit of rent, fair market value. They got 300 patients that they were rolling every couple of day, weeks. They did telemedicine. They did everything, but they were very administrative and very bureaucratic. And then they killed the program. They had a grant yeah. finish for it. And then once the grant finished. What yeah. happened? They killed it because you know what the answer was? We couldn't support the social worker. Right. I think this is a good restaurant analogy that if I were to run a restaurant, where do restaurants make their money? Dinners, dinners and drinks and stuff, but dinners of people they know, right? People walk in there, they know you, they know what to order, not giving you a hard time. 
if you screw up a little bit, they've known you, so it's all good, okay? That's where you're going to make your money. Established diners coming in who know you well. Where do you lose money? People coming in for dessert and staying for two hours and three hours and chatting. But like when they turn, when, like when babies turn sick, how many times do you get a call in the middle of the night for the, the eight month old that has 103 fever who looks horrible and they don't have Motrin ibuprofen, which is phenomenal treating fever. And they call you, they're worried, they rush to the ER, they get the Motrin, they look better and they go home and stuff. So starting at six months, we give them a bottle of children's ibuprofen. This is what you're going to use. Even the formula we give away to shelters. So. I'm available when they need me after hours, but we don't have office hours, evenings or weekends. So setting limits has helped you retain staff, have a healthy culture, and most importantly, you're not burning out. No, I'm not burning out now. I'm not that I, no, I, I, I guess I was burning out, but about five years ago, we wanted to take a, like a two week family vacation. That was hard, right? Because I, I, my covering doctor wasn't seeing the checkups back then, but no, I don't, I enjoy the challenge. I enjoy having the other providers. I tend to be an optimist. So I find the problems. I like solving problems. And that's when I found out Steve is an optimist. You said you work from home one day a week. What well, do you do? I work from home one day a week. Doing you administrative do. work at home, billing. Right, stuff, right. Maybe and, and then telemedicine. and that's working from home. So it, we have good space for, there's three providers here, but six exam rooms, which is very comfortable for two providers per day. We stagger the days, so there's only two providers. So I'm in the office on Tuesday, but Tuesday I'll only do video appointments. And so I do a lot of the older kids, the medication checks, we manage our own medications and we have them set for like different, three times a year, we'll have a set video check. And so there are some Tuesdays I'll be here where I'll do 15 to 20 telemed visits at my desk. So I'm here supporting the office, not answering any questions. But I'm not taking up staff space. I'm not taking up room space. I love the feeling on Friday when yes. you're in the afternoon and you're ready for a weekend. But I don't mind. I, mean, I love my time off. Don't get me wrong. But no, you should go to work. To have you should have a good time at work. Yes. I, 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 I love have... the patient. I, like I said, the first thing we asked, why did you become a pediatrician? I think the, 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 the walking in that room with the toddlers is hysterical. You never know what they're going to say. They're admiring their sparkle shoes and just talking about random stuff and. I learn from them. I talk to the teenagers and they're telling me they're into something. I don't know what it is. I'll look it up on the internet and start asking them questions about it. But I really wish the, the residencies would send people interested in primary care into offices that are, that are feeling good just to give them the impression or it gives, not impression, just give them the view of what can be done. Because I think sometimes it's doom or gloom. I, I think all of you said is right. We need payment to be addressed because we, it's just this, the nature of life. Nobody beats a clock. Yeah. But we all get old. Yeah. And we need some happy, engaged workforce that's coming behind us to take our mm -hmm. demand. Payment to them is important because they have huge financial burden from student loans. I, I think taking care of a child, like this is important. It's taking care of an adult. So yeah. if it's a 99213, I deserve the same money as the intern is. If oh, it's absolutely. a 99214, I deserve the same money as the intern is. Absolutely. If it's a 99215, I deserve the same money as the intern is. Because the child's not worth half an adult. Why should, exactly. I, get, why should I get paid $180,000, say $160,000 to start, while the radiologist gets paid $400,000 to start and only works 40 weeks a week, a year? That's just not fair. No children matter. Remember, I'm right. Remember, I'm right. So that's ask for let's ask for enough payment so we can do the work we want to do it right and give access to everybody. <laughs> Day. Thank you so much. Well, it's it's always a joy to see you. Yeah. But thank you. Great, you know, I love listening to your podcast and hearing thank about you. all the different pediatricians and pediatric related people around the country giving their stories. So thank, thank you for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. And you like the click and clack arguments with George. That's part of the podcast. <laughs> All 